as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. What's really good? And welcome back to another collaboration episode of the Sanchez Show and Real Fans Real Talk. I am your host, Eric Sanchez, a.k.a. Legend of Two Games. And as always, I have Anthony Jones with me, a.k.a. Trip Young, fresh off of vacation, as you can see by his shirt. He's feeling himself today. Understandably so, though. Bro, how you doing, man? Yeah, man, I'm good, man. I, I'm, I'm rested. I feel reinvigorated, man. I'm still in my beach chair, though. You see, that's why I got the, you know, I got the trees, the flowers and all that on, on my shirt this week because I needed like one or two more days in Miami. Uh, just a great time. Ran into um, to Rev Run out there, him and his wife, uh, Rico Love. Martha Stewart was out there getting it in, chefing it up. You know what I'm saying? So it, it, it was it was a, it was a great, great time I had in Miami. But the NBA players have started. I was I was hoping, you know, if Miami had a had a home series because I would have went to one of them games while I was out there. But uh, but yeah, man, let's just jump right into this NBA playoffs, man, because it got exciting this weekend. You're absolutely right. I'm glad to hear you had a great time out there. But now it's time to get back to business, man. The the second season has started now. The NBA playoffs. Um, obviously, your Lakers going up against Phoenix. Lakers don't look 100 percent still. Um, you and I spoke during the playing game. I thought they looked a little rusty and that carried over to game one. What was your thoughts on game one as that played out? Yeah, um, they, they, they definitely looked a, a, a little bit like they were still getting their feet, uh, their legs, getting their legs back um, in game one. Um, I thought that LeBron sat out more than he should have, especially in that first half because it was in the first quarter, things were going pretty much back and forth, but it was it was a really tight game. And then once LeBron went out, it was just like Phoenix just started going. And for me, they just kept that up until uh to, to, to the end of the game, ultimately winning. Um, but I, I also I think that, you know, and I know that the Lakers, especially we, we saw this last season, they they use game one the same way Floyd Mayweather uses the first four rounds of a boxing fight, filling things out, filling the opponent out. Um, and I think that, you know, moving forward, we'll see the NBA champion Lakers against this Phoenix team. I don't expect Anthony Davis to have a game the way he, he played uh, yesterday again in this series. I expect more of what we saw in the last game they played before the playoffs started. I expect to see more of that. Um, I liked, I, I like Trez. Trez was, Trez was pretty good uh, coming off the bench. It seemed like LeBron and him, they got a nice little chemistry going on. Um, Shorter, Shorter was all right. Caruso, you know, it was all he was he was okay. Contavious, he was hitting a couple of shots, but I just think I think that now that they I think they got the wrinkles out with game one, and I think they win game two. Um, they're actually the favorite last time I checked to to win game two. So I guess you know they probably people probably looking at it the way I look at it, like like you know that whole Floyd Mayweather thing where they're just filling out their opponent. And again, we saw this last year pretty much with every series they lost game one, um, and then you know ultimately went on to win the finals. Yeah, so um, they are the favorites right now. We're recording this on Monday, May 24th. So right now they have them as uh, one and a half point favorites going into game two, which would be tomorrow night. I don't know how much of that is predicated on Chris Paul's injury. I don't know if Vegas feels like Chris Paul may be a little limited. I don't know how much of that, like you said, is maybe just the Lakers feeling it out and Vegas viewed it as Lakers didn't play their best game and ultimately still only lost by nine. 
Um, and when I say only, I mean, because they really defensively, they didn't play poorly. It's just offensively, they didn't execute as well. And for me, the, the biggest thing with the Lakers we've talked about all, all season, obviously has been health. If they're healthy, they are the best team in the NBA. There's no debating that. But I think for me now, it's about them getting their legs under them. Um, that was my biggest concern. That's why I like this series the best for the Lakers, because in terms of matchups in the first round, I thought you wanted to play a team that was pretty beatable. And I think Phoenix is beatable. Phoenix isn't very deep. I don't think they really have many answers for AD when he's on, on his game, but he's got to be on his game. And ultimately, these guys got to get back in game shape. I found it very odd that LeBron was kind of on a minutes restriction for the Warriors game. And then Frank Vogel kind of had to throw that out the window and say, hey, look, we got to just win the game. But they wanted to keep him to 30 minutes that night. He ended up playing 37, I believe. They had to go above it. Same thing kind of yesterday. Like you said, they sat him down. And at halftime, he had only played 14 minutes of a possible 24 minutes, yeah. which is a little odd, again, because it's game one, it's on the road. And if you could steal that game, which I thought it was very winnable, if you could steal that game, you kind of alter the series and you alter the mindset of a Phoenix team that doesn't have much experience in the playoffs. So I expect to see a better Laker team in game two. But more importantly, I expect to see a, a Laker team that just seems to be um, more comfortable in the situation. I think right now they still seem a little rigid. Guys are trying to figure things out. Like you said, Trez and, and Braun probably have a little bit of a chemistry, but I don't think Braun and Drummond have much of a chemistry. I don't think AD and Drummond have much of a chemistry. And Dennis Schroeder, who also missed some time, is trying to work his way into the mix as well. So I think game two, we're going to see them look a little better. I expect Frank Vogel to make some adjustments on defense. They got to figure out what they're going to do with Devin Booker, though, because they can't let Booker go off the way he did and allow DeAndre Ayton to control the boards. One of the things that we always highlighted was that the Lakers have so much size, we expect them to win that rebound battle. DeAndre Ayton can't have that type of game again. And more importantly, Devin Booker just can't control the pace and the tempo as he did in game one. So we got to watch that one going into game two. One of the other big storylines coming out of game one, though, and it was the last game of the game ones this weekend. Utah loses at home to Memphis. Memphis is getting on a little hot streak right now to not only get in, but then steal game one. But then the news broke after that Donovan Mitchell thought he was going to play, said he had no pain, practiced three times this week. But then for whatever reason, Utah's coaching and medical staff held him out of the game yesterday, heard it with some tense moments behind the scenes. What do we really make of that situation in Utah right now? Um, I mean, again, I thought he was going to play as, as well, which kind of sucks because it was sort of a game time decision that he didn't play. So I know that kind of threw off – or for, 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 for all the guys that like to put a little something down on the, on the games, I know that kind of threw that off. Um, but I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous. I, I think I still feel like Utah can beat Memphis uh, in, in, in the series without uh, Donovan Mitchell. Um, but like you said, they're hot right now. Um, and they surprised me yesterday. They surprised me. They surprised me yesterday. Um, they surprised me in the in the playing tournament. Uh, you know, beating 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 up on, on on Golden State, even though I I thought that Memphis was gonna win, but I just couldn't bring myself to bet against Steph in that situation. Um, but Utah is definitely going to need Donovan Mitchell if they make it out of the out of the first round. I don't know what's going on. For their sake, I hope he's back um, because even though I think they can beat Memphis without Donovan Mitchell, it's going to be hard. And you don't want to get into a situation where you fall behind in the series because now what happens if they say, oh, no, Donovan Mitchell can't play game two and you lose game two. And now you got to go to Memphis down 0-2. That's going to be a tough hole to climb out of. Yeah, Utah – isn't explosive offensively. They're a team that's kind of built to beat you, you know, by a thousand cuts and we'll just keep cutting and chopping you down as the game goes on, you know, and, and their depth is really what does it because when Donovan does come off the court, you got Jordan Clarkson, you got Joe Ingles who are both up for six man of the year. Uh, Rudy isn't a big offensive force, but he definitely controls everything defensively. And then you got a veteran like Mike Conley. So I agree with you. I don't think they can afford to go down 0-2 and put themselves in a situation where they have to win four of those next five games against a Memphis team that's playing with a lot of confidence. John Morant has already said, this is what we want. We want this pressure. We want this moment. He's showing it. Dylan Brooks, shout out to him. Shout out to a lot of the young guys making their first playoff appearances that are really showing up. Cause not only those two guys, Trey young 
He yes. had an amazing debut performance at the Garden against my Knicks yesterday. We're going to get into that series as well. But we're seeing a lot of young guys adjust and, and take on the pressure and respond to that pressure. And so if you're Utah, you don't want to be going to Memphis down 0-2 in front of a raucous crowd, because they're going to have crowd, a crowd there as well. I don't, I'm not sure what the capacity will be, but they will have fans in the seats. You don't want to go there against a team that has a lot of confidence, feeling like, all right, now we're up 2-0 and we could possibly finish this off at home. Um, I do want to ask you, though, Trip. we saw a couple upsets on the road. I don't really categorize the Hawks over the Knicks as an upset. That's a considered, it's a 4-5 matchup, and by most people, it's considered to be a 6-7 or seven game series, so we expect it to be close. But Dallas went into L.A. and beat the Clippers. And then obviously Memphis went into Utah one. What team that's down 0-1 are you most concerned about right now? Um, I mean, I, I it would have to be Utah just because I, I'm not sure what's going on with Donovan Mitchell right now. Um, I would love to say it's the Clippers, but I think with the Clippers, I think, you know, I don't know. I don't know what they were doing as far as trying to guard Luca. Um, you know, and I say that because you have two of two top ten two way players with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, who are both elite defenders. I don't understand why you are trying to force uh, the, the 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 job of guarding Luca onto Patrick Beverly, who is six one, and Luca is about six seven, maybe even even six eight. I was confused by that um, throughout game one. I would hope, because I do respect Ty Lue as a coach, I would hope that either Paul George or or Kawhi or, or a combination of those two guys is going to be guarding uh, Luka throughout game two. And I think they win game two if that, if that actually happens. Um, but I think it, it, it has to be Utah just because, again, if – you know, if, if, if you go down 0-2 in the series because Donovan Mitchell isn't there and it's not like this, this Utah team has that much playoff experience. You know what I mean? Where they've been going on these deep runs for the past five years and they've been there before. This is actually, you know, playoff-wise, this is actually a relatively young team as well. So we're talking about, you know, young guys versus versus young guys. Um, I know you got Mike Conley out there who does have a, a lot of playoff experience, but Donovan Mitchell was, hasn't been going to the playoffs the past, past five years, Go Bear, none of those guys. So they're actually in a very tricky situation where if Donovan Mitchell doesn't play and these guys can steal game two and go back home up 2-0, it's going to be hard for, for Utah to creep out of that hole. Yeah, so Utah has, has more playoff experience than Memphis, but to your point, I don't think you, I think Utah's only been to the second round one time with this core group of guys. They've gotten bumped in the, in the first round a couple of times uh, by Harden and Houston. Then obviously it happened last year as well with Denver. So they don't have much experience of winning series. They have some, you know, playoff experience in the sense of, hey, we've had to play a couple of series, but do you know how to win a series? You haven't shown that you can come back in a series. You haven't shown that you can close out a series because obviously last year you were three, one and can't close that one out. So that's where the doubt starts to creep in. If you go down 0-2 or even go down 3-1, where it's like, how are we supposed to get back? Because we've never had to do it before. Um, the Clippers, it is a unique uh, take that they're using defensively. As you mentioned, they haven't had their two guys on them, on Luka. I think that they're looking at it from the standpoint of, we're going to kind of let those guys roam and play free safety and try to take some other guys away, which for three quarters, it did work. Luca was getting his, but nobody else was getting theirs. But then the defense completely broke down in the fourth quarter. Jalen Brunson and Hardaway Jr. started to go off. And that's really what carried Dallas in that game because Luca points-wise slowed down in the fourth, but everything else he does became highlighted. He was able to find other guys, get some corner threes. Przingis was terrible in that game. And he was a guy that last year we thought if they had him in the series, they could have forced that to a seven game with the Clippers. He's got to play better, though, if Dallas thinks they're going to win the series. He's yeah. supposed to be the second best player on that team. He shot three for 12 in game one. He was a complete non-factor offensively or defensively. He's got to be better. But the Clippers' defensive adjustments are going to be the main thing to watch. For me, the team that I'm a little scared for that's down 0-1, and this is because of who they're playing and then also because of injuries, is the Denver Nuggets. They don't have their second-best player. Their defense was never up an echelon in terms of being able to shut you down. They always want to kind of put you on the track meet and outscore you. What other night? 
the Trailblazers put up 123 points on you. Uh, Dame was feeling it. Melo was feeling it. And if you're going to try to play that style against Portland, all your guns got to be firing. You got to be able to score points because you know Dame is going to get his. So I don't like that situation for Denver right now. I think they're in real trouble going into game two tonight. If they lose those two games at home, having to go back to Portland, down 0-2 without your second best player, it puts a lot of pressure on the, on the Joker to try to have to win that series against a fully loaded Portland team. This is one of the few times they've been healthy all year. Yeah, and and and, and this this isn't a young Portland team with a bunch of guys that haven't having been on 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 good playoff runs. This is a very experienced uh, playoff team. Dame is one of the best players in basketball. Melo has been around this game for a very long time. And he, he, does, he does know how to win. These guys know how to win basketball games. So, yeah, it can get tricky for Denver as well. I, I thought that, you know, that last game of the of the season when they played uh, Portland and they got beat, I thought that was just a, a blip in the matrix. But, you know, looking at this game, at the game last night, you know, maybe, maybe I was wrong. Maybe it's not. This might be the reality where this is the series – the upset series where Portland wins this series. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, you know, they don't have their, their 50 plus point guy in there in Jamal Murray this year. So it, it can get tough. They're going to need Michael Porter jr. You know, to, to do some, some crazy numbers in this series. They're going to need the rest of those guys to, uh, to, to step up. It can't just be joking uh, out there. Just, just, just doing him. Everybody's got to, got to step up. They, they have to make up, the absence of Jamal Murray and like, you know, cause that's the other thing too, is like, usually what happens is when you have uh, either, you know, all-star caliber player on the other side of the basketball, you know, guy like Dame is going to have to guard up CJ going to have to guard up. So it, it takes away a little bit of that energy that you have on the offensive end. You're not dealing with that no more. So these guys can just go off. CJ is one of the better shooters in this league from, from, from behind the arc. So, and, and now you're talking about Dame, he don't, he doesn't really have to work, work on the defensive end. So he can really use all that energy, just doing whatever he wants offensively. And that's what we saw those guys doing whatever they wanted offensively. Shout out to Melo. And for all of you, 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 you know, you guys out there that tried to say he was done, he couldn't play in his league anymore. He was outdated. The joke is on you because he is still out there doing his thing. And I got to tip my hat to Melo. Um, and, and, you know, we a couple of weeks ago, we highlighted him for for moving into the um, the top 10 all time scoring list. And he's still out here doing it, balling, um, you know, great game. I, I don't even know. You know, it's 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 rough. It's gonna be a rough one for Denver too, man. They they better hope that they that they win game two. Cause if they win, if if they don't win game two, this series is over. All Absolutely. The, on. I one thousand percent agree. If the, if tonight is a must win for Denver, you cannot go down 0-2 uh going to Portland. Going into the series, I I expected Portland to play desperate, right? We've already started to hear the rumors that they may want out. Uh this could be their last real shot at trying to be competitive in the West, though no one has them winning the West. If they could find a way to win this series, at least it may buy the organization a little more time to, to sell Dame on what the long-term plan is. They came out, they looked desperate. They looked like they wanted it more game one. Tonight, Denver's got to show me something. They got to they gotta rebound big time tonight and show me that they plan on being competitive in this series. If you go down 0-2 and Dame starts smelling blood in the water, Dame is going to go for the kill back in Portland. We know that. We go. We're gonna see a whole a whole lot of this. It's gonna be a whole lot of Dame time if y'all don't get it together. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, let, let's transition though. Let's get into a little NFL talk. Uh, mini camps should be opening up. Spring practices, all that going on. We're a few months away from preseason, but obviously the biggest story that's gonna dominate as we go into training camp is Deshaun Watson. Depositions have been set for February 22nd. So that would be at the end of the season. However, the Texans are floating around the idea of having him on paid leave just because of the distraction that it would create for the team um, and into mini, mini camp and trading camp and, and preseason. Trip, where do we stand with this, man? Because we know it's a lot to digest. We've, we're trying to let the process play out. But I, I mean, has anything really changed your, your mindset on, on this whole situation for Deshaun? I mean... I'm just not no not not yet because I'm 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 still I'm still trying to stay in the middle on this one for right now. Um, you know I 
haven't heard anything. I mean, from any of the victims, really, I haven't seen any anything that was concrete as of yet, except for just statements and allegations. So I'm still waiting. Again, you, the deposition is not going to be until Fe until February, which is after the Super Bowl. Not that I thought whether Deshaun Watson played for the Texans or not, they were going to the Super Bowl. That don't even matter. They probably won't even, wouldn't even uh, make the playoffs. Um, but it's, it's, it's a tough situation. Um, I do feel bad for everybody involved, uh, you know, because, again, you know, we don't condone any type of sexual misconduct, anything like that. Um, but we also don't condone false allegations. Um, we'll see. Deshaun Watson is, you know, we're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, even though, you know, we know for, for, for people that from we from, they don't always get that. Um, but I, I'm going to I'm still I'm still waiting as far as to 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 make my decision on that. As far as him playing this season, um, I mean, if I'm if I'm the Texans, I mean, unless we unless we just playing for the number, well, did, did they have their pick in the following year's draft? So 2022 is they have the pick, and it's the first time they have their first round pick since 2019. So they they've gone quite a while yeah. without having a first round pick. So if that is the it's, it's, since since that's the case. Then yeah, now it makes sense to you know let's just put them on paid leave. We don't have to worry about the headache, and we're probably gonna wind up losing out because the only reason they won games the past season was because of Deshaun Watson being as good as he is. Because you pretty much stripped away every piece of help that he may have had on the offensive and on the defensive side of the football. So now we're talking about first, you know, them getting possibly getting the first overall pick in the draft and then they could just draft a quarterback of the future. And then after that, then it's like whatever happens from there happens because we got our quarterback of the future anyway. And then we can still come back around if things work out in Deshaun Watson's favor. then you know what? Now, at that point, we can trade him and still get a King's ransom for him, because once once he's passed anything, any any of the the, the legal stuff and he can just play football. His his value is, goes right back to where it was before all of this stuff came out. But you'd all, you'd have your quarterback of the future, so you don't have to worry about Deshaun Watson. And then you could still you could possibly have two of the top three picks in next year's draft, depending on who falls into those places. Because <clears throat> me, let's just let's just say Washington. For example, who doesn't have an, an, an all pro type of, of quarterback, it's, you know, shout out to, to, to Ryan Fitzpatrick, but I mean, he's older anyway. So let's just say they have a top three pick. Now you done lost all these games. So you already got the number one pick. You could probably flip Deshaun Watson to Washington and you could wind up with, 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 with two of the top picks in this draft. I'm just using Washington as an example, but it could actually work out really well for the Texans where you could get a, the, the top quarterback in the draft and then come back right around and get the top wide receiver in the draft or the top defense player. If there's like a chase young, that's coming out of this, out of uh, next year's draft, there's a caliber player of that caliber coming out. So they could actually be in a very good position moving forward if they put uh, Deshaun Watson on paid leave. Yeah, the only part of that I don't agree with you on is what his value will be when he hits the trading uh, market. Because you and I both know that when it comes to second chances, black quarterbacks aren't given the same leverage as white quarterbacks. White well, quarterbacks, I mean, when it comes to second and third. If he doesn't have to, if, let's just say he's found innocent on all charges. That's what I'm saying. Even, even, if, he's, even, if, if, even if he's found innocent, uh, in the court of public opinion, he will still be criticized and chastised. And that, that's where I say he won't get the fair shake. He won't have that, that leverage of, hey, look, I was innocent and I'm moving forward now. It'll be something that, that follows him around no matter what, because he is a, a black man in America. We know that. We, we got to point out the elephant in the room. But you don't um, think that he would warrant a, a top uh, five pick in the, in the draft still? Depending on the team. If, if you're, again, for, for the scenario you presented, yes. If you're Washington, absolutely. But if you're picking top five and let's say you're the Chargers, let's say uh, yeah. you're Jacksonville, 
you know, yeah, if you're a team that doesn't need the quarterback, then maybe he doesn't, you know, and it becomes a little trickier. But ultimately, it, just from a football standpoint, because as you mentioned, you know, we we feel bad for the victims of the situation. It's a very ugly situation all the way around, no matter what angle you take in the discussion. But purely from a football standpoint, the Texans, their incompetence and their stubbornness is what has sabotaged their franchise, right? They made a bunch of bad trades before they even got to this point. Mm-hmm. You and I both thought when Deshaun said he wanted out that they should flip him. They had no first round pick in this year's past draft. They had no second round pick in this year's past draft. They could have gotten a boatload for Deshaun Watson and started the, the uh, you know, the rebuild of their organization and their franchise. And instead they said they were going to hold on to him. Then when this news broke, all trade offer, offers stopped. People stopped giving up first round picks and even engaging in that conversation because it was like, no, we need to see how this is going to play out before we can even try to acquire Deshaun. So now the Texans are at a point, like you said, where they're going to probably pay him to stay home. They're going to punt on the season, get the number one overall pick, and then still have to figure out what they're going to do with this trade. When we look back on this, we're going to say this was an organization who had a top five quarterback in his prime and never even came close to a Super Bowl. And then ultimately had the punt on that because he's still in his prime. So now you had the punt on that situation, right? And completely start over. Just think two years ago, this organization, three years ago, I'm gonna go just a little further. Three years ago, this organization had under contract Deshaun Watson, DeAndre Hopkins, JJ Watt, Teron Matthew. All four of those guys who were probably gonna end up in the Hall of Fame were all Texans at the same time and you never capitalized on it. And then you also gave away a bunch of draft picks, a bunch of dumb trades. You never made anything of it. And now you're going to have to start all over. Just from a football standpoint, it's just terrible for the Texans. The smartest thing that they could have done with, with, with in reality, I mean, I, I get it because I, I know you, you want to try to keep Deshaun Watson if you're the Texans because he is a top five caliber quarterback. He's, an, he's, he's one of those guys. So, yeah, you, you love to keep him if that's the case. But if he's adamant about leaving, I'm, I'm sending him to Jacksonville and I'm getting the number one pick in the draft. I would have made that decision already. Okay, you know what? You don't want to be here. There's a guy that's coming in who's going to be one of the one of those guys. He's going to be a franchise quarterback. Obviously, you got to prove it in the NFL. But we're in a situation where this kid does not want to be here anymore. We can get the, that first overall pick that 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 Jacksonville has. And we could have got that other pick that they had in the first round probably as well. And maybe even a position guy for Deshaun Watson. I'm pretty sure Jacksonville would take a proven Deshaun Watson in exchange for passing up on, on Trevor Lawrence, because we're talking about somebody who is that caliber, who is proven, who is a top five quarterback right now. And he's young. He's still in his prime. I don't even, he may, he may not have even gotten into his prime just yet. He may be just getting into into his prime, so you, I would I would have made the move and got and got and drafted Trevor Lawrence. We this whole thing would have been forgotten. We wouldn't be dealing with his legal issues or anything like that. That would have been a distraction for Jacksonville. Sorry, but you don't want to be here. I'm not trying to hold anybody. And there is a guy coming in that is looked at as one of those caliber of guys. Here, take him, and we'll take him. Yeah, I 1000% agree. And, and you and I said that when this story was first developing about him wanting out. But again, their stubbornness has gotten in the way of progressing a franchise that had a lot of potential. And now you're going to be starting from ground zero, it looks like again. Uh, another story. Getting rid of guys. <laughs> really quick. Yeah. That should, they should keep, they get rid of those guys. Yeah. Uh, another story that's developing very quickly. Eugene Chung uh, played in the NFL for three seasons was an assistant offensive lineman coach for another nine. So very experienced uh, man in the world of football. Recently on on an interview he was doing, and I'm not sure if it was on an actual podcast, but he discussed, I guess, some of the behind the scenes things that take place during interview process. And he kind of pulled the curtain back and explained to people that during an interview, it was detailed to him that he wasn't the right minority for a job opening. Now, they haven't disclosed who the team was. He hasn't anyway. The NFL has already said they would be willing to look into it if he's willing to disclose who the team was. 
uh, obviously who the front office exec he was speaking with, and then ultimately, you know, doing a little more due dil diligence, how it all came about, yada, 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 context of the conversation. Um, long story short, though, Trip, this is something that you and I have spoken about in terms of diversity throughout the ranks of the NFL. We see it all the time. What were your thoughts when you heard about these comments? Well, all right. So I, I had to add two thoughts because my, my, my first thought was if you weren't going to say which team said, said it, then why'd you even make it into this big thing in the first place? But that was, that was my thoughts in regards to him. Then I, then I went to, well, what's the, it's the, the type of minority that they're looking for because we just went a whole nother season where the, no, no uh, black head coaches were, were, were hired. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, right. There were, how many, do we, how many new black coaches do we have or, or Brown? So, no that matter. Right. He, I'm assuming that he was not being interviewed for a head coaching position. So let's, let's be clear. Right. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking his contributions because again, he's been an assistant coach, an assistant offensive line coach for nine years. He started out with the Eagles with Andy Reed. He went to Kansas city with Andy Reed. And then he went back to Philly with Doug Peterson and helped them win a super bowl. So he has a super bowl ring. He's been an assistant offensive line coach for nine years. No way, shape or form should that qualify you to be a head coach. Yeah. And, and again, that isn't knocking his football knowledge, but let's be very clear that the qualifications to be an NFL head coach take a little bit more than just be the assistant offensive line coach. Yeah. Right. So I think we're clear on that. I agree with you though. And, and I know this, a lot of people are not going to like what you and I are both about to say, because I think we're on the same page here. One, if you weren't going to spill the beans completely on who the team was or who this exec was, what was the point? Yeah. Two, and my immediate thought when I read this was, are we making more about this because of the state of the country right now when it, when it comes to discrimination against Asian Americans? Because I'm not saying what was said to him was right. It's completely wrong to say that or to try to justify, I'm not hiring you because you're not the right minority. However, as you mentioned, there are black and brown football coaches who are far more qualified than Eugene Chung to hold a position who aren't getting hired and we're not, there isn't a big uproar about it. There isn't a big discussion about it. It kind of just move it along. Let's keep the process going. Eric Bieniemy, Todd Bowles, Byron Leftwich, those are three black assistant coaches, assistant coaches and offensive coordinators, right? Because Eric Bieniemy's is an offensive coordinator, Byron Leftwich, offensive coordinator, uh, Todd Bowles, defensive coordinator. And I believe Leftwich and Bieniemy are also the assistant coaches on their staff. Yeah. Those three were all coaching teams that were in the Super Bowl, yet got no interviews for head coaching positions. Where is the uproar for those coaches? That's what I said. I'm confused because I'm I'm trying to figure out who 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 who's the right type of minority. Like what we're right. talking about, and if, if you, is it like they wanted a woman coach? So that is that the minority they wanted? <laughs> did they did they let say, like I I don't know who's the minority you were looking for. Um, because obviously, like I said, the, the top, the top guys in football that should be at the top of the list for, for coaching jobs, didn't get jobs. I don't even think do we, do we have any new black coaches last season? Either? I don't I think, I think the last two years we haven't had a new, uh, a minority coach. Uh, so this, this off season for sure, I would have to double back and, and check for last season. And I want to say no as well, but I know for I this, season, no. this season, this season, this past off season, I know for a fact, no, because we had to talk where, remember, there were no black head coaches hired, yeah. yet the NFL released a report that there was a doubling in hiring yeah. of minority coaches. And we and we immediately said, yeah, but they weren't hired at the highest level. They yeah. weren't hired to be head coaches. You brought them on to continue to be defensive coordinators and offensive coordinators. We saw that with Raheem Morris, who was the interim coach in Atlanta. He mm -hmm. gets let go. The Rams pick him up as a defensive coordinator. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So we've had that discussion. And for anybody who's going to try to jump in the comment section and, oh, you guys are encouraging, uh, uh, you know, division and, and, and you guys are discriminating toward. No, we're not. We think everybody should get a fair shot. We, yeah. We've always talked about that. We want everyone to have a fair shot. I just don't want this to become an uproar because Eugene Chung has said something now when yeah. 
this is a conversation we've had every off season about black head coaches. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it, the obviously things things haven't changed. I'm just I'm, I'm still a little confused. Um, but again, you know, just to, to go back to you know the original uh, premise, if you weren't going to say who the team was that said it, then I don't even honestly, I I I, I could care less that you said it. If I'm being real, like if I if I'm being honest. I don't even care then. If you're not going to tell me where it came from, I don't care. Sorry. There we go. There you have it. Uh, one more football t- uh, topic before we transition to uh, the Green Bay Packers said they're not taking any offers for Aaron Rodgers right now. They're basically calling his bluff. He has hinted at possibly sitting out this season. He's also said he wants the GM fired before he comes back. Is Aaron Rodgers playing this year? Pretty simple, right? Do you think he's playing this year? I mean, his so my thing is this: I, it's well, not for the I, Packers. I should say that. Yeah, is he playing for the Packers. Not that I don't believe that he would sit out, but at Aaron Rodgers' age, can he really afford to sit out? Because now, you know, getting older, you know, you can't really be giving up seasons because you don't have that many seasons left. It was one thing when we were talking about Deshaun Watson saying he was willing to to sit out a season at twenty five years old. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is uh, 36. I don't think Aaron Rodgers right now. He's up there, yeah. 36, 36, 37. Yeah, so you don't have that much years left. And again, MVP of the league, he's still one of the top guys in football, but there's just not a lot of time left in your career for you to hold out. Now, will he do it? I don't know. How bad does he want to leave? But, you know, if if he does sit out, I don't think it's gonna. We're gonna get too many games in before they start taking some offers. If that's the case, if they're not taking them now, if Aaron Rodgers sits out because he didn't go to the um, was the OTAs that started? Uh, mm-hmm. That believe was he's yeah, not. He hasn't. Not he hasn't shown up. I don't even think he's has any has has had any communication with yeah. the front office. I think he's so, kind of cut it off. If we get into the season and we go, like I said, two two three games in. Then I would I would assume they're gonna start making some trade possibilities, as, uh, especially if if Jordan Love is, goes out there and starts stinking it up. Yeah, I, I think they're gonna keep calling his bluff. Honestly, like you said, he doesn't have years to give away. It ultimately comes down to does Aaron Rodgers really want it anymore? Does he think his legacy is on the line, or he's chasing anything in particular? If he feels like I've accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish then he doesn't need to stick around. He's made more than enough money and he's going to make a lot of, he's going to make a lot more money when he stops playing. Um, but Jeopardy. if he feels, yeah, like Jeopardy, like State Farm commercials, you know, I'm, I'm sure he, I'm sure he may even go into some football talk out on a pregame show or something like that. So he's going to have plenty of opportunities. Um, but if he feels there's something left on the table in terms of legacy, he's going to play. If he feels there isn't, I think he'll outright retire. Um, because if I'm the Packers, I, I wouldn't trade him. I'm be honest. I, I'm not. I'm not trading you. Um, I'm gonna call your bluff. If you want to walk away, then so be it. You walk away, but I'm not gonna appease you now and give in to your demands. And then gonna because then you're gonna want me to work with you on what team I'm sending you to. Yeah. And let's be honest. You know, if if, if I gotta send you to a playoff contender, them first round picks don't hit the same no more. You know what I'm saying? So, I, I think I'm calling your bluff on that. That's just my opinion on it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I agree. All right, let's uh let's get into some baseball talk. Your Yankees are hot, man. Corey Kluber just had a no hitter. It was the first one pitched for the Yankees since David Cohn's in 1999. It was the sixth of the Major League Baseball season. Certain people like Clayton Kershaw feel it's bad for the game. I personally don't think it's bad for the game. But Trip, what were your thoughts when you heard Clayton's um comments? I don't even understand as as a pitcher how he could say that's bad for the game. <laughs> Throwing no hitters, like I, don't get me wrong. I love a good home run. I mean, the Yankees usually are in the top like three teams as far as home runs for a team in in a season. Um, But yeah, I'd like to see a pitcher that can no hit somebody. I I actually love it. Like I don't, I'm not one of those guys that's just, yeah, offense, 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 put some numbers on the board, even though baseball is a slower sport. Um, But no, I want to see, especially for my team, I, I want my team to go out there and no hit the, the, the opposition every night. I don't know what Clayton Kershaw is talking about. I, I, I'm just shocked by that. That to be a pitcher to say it's not good for the game. How is it? How is 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 defense not good for baseball? I don't I don't understand that one. 
Um, shout out to Corey uh, Huber. Um, you know, again, it's a 1999. You can 1999. That's a long time, which is crazy, you know, for the Yankees. But I love it. I love the fact that we got six no hitters already to start the season. It's not like, and it's not, you know, it's not like every game we've seen a no hitter. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not that we, 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 we're a month and a half into the season and there were six. How many games have been played in in this month and a half? Yeah. And, and I think sometimes people that are so deep into baseball and baseball culture, like we love baseball, but obviously we talk other sports throughout the season as well. But sometimes people are so deep in baseball culture forget <laughs> that baseball is a bit of a dying sport. Right. And so during the regular season, people ain't tuning in and checking in on games as much people yeah. people may flash and check the score real quick yep. people may hey I'm gonna I'm watch an inning or two but guess what the NBA game is on right I'm probably more into that game right now than sitting around for three hours watching this baseball game however if I get an alert from ESPN that going into the seventh inning there's a no hitter alert going on maybe I'm more inclined now to flip back over to that channel and watch a little bit more of that game absolutely so no hitters no hitters are great for baseball especially in the regular season where again, it's a 162 game marathon and you want people to be interested. You don't want people to just open an app, check the score and then shut it back down. You want people to tune in. You want people to flip over. You want people to, you want storylines that you can sell to people that make them get interested in watching a baseball game. So it's great for the game of baseball. I think the same way, like you said, the same way the home run is great for the game of baseball, right? If I get an alert that tells me Fernando Tatis has two home runs in his first two at bats, I'm probably going to want to try to catch that third at bat to see if it's a third one. Of course. You know, so it's great for the game. Uh, I think, you know, Clayton is a baseball purist, but I think he also forgets that the game gets very boring during these dog days of summer. And a little excitement never hurt nobody. You're you're a diehard Mets fan. I'm a diehard Yankees fan. People can't tell us either about our teams. Uh, but I, I've said it before on the show. I don't watch baseball ball outside of the Yankees during the regular season. I watched, I watched the Yankees, but this is, this is with us having a sports show. You know what I'm saying? I, I read more about baseball than I actually watch it just as far as doing my homework and stuff for the show, so, you know, so, but again, a no hitter is going to have me tune in to the second half of that game because I want to see if, if, if it's actually going to happen because I understand how difficult it is and that they don't come every day. Again, we're talking about, 20 years between the last <laughs> Yankee no hitter. That is a big deal. You know what I mean? So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what, what he's talking about. I'm, I'm all for it though. Yeah. I, th- I think he's bugging on that. Uh, speaking of the Mets, Mets struggling a little bit. I mean, we got about 16 guys on the injured list right now, but Jacob so, DeGrom is, okay. yeah. Jacob DeGrom is supposed to come back tomorrow, which is a positive sign. Noah Syndergaard started throwing, so he should be ready by next month. Hopefully we start to get some of these guys back and see what's going on there, man. But like I said, the Yankees have been hot. You guys took care of the White Sox this weekend. White Sox were a hot team and you guys handled them. You handled your business there, man. Um, speaking of business, and like I said, we, we, we've hinted at these things on the show. They come to fruition. Now we know it's official. Tyson Fury, Tyson Fury Deontay Wilder, the trilogy, it's on. <laughs> No, and Eric, I'm, I'm sorry. I, the reason I'm laughing is because I literally just said last week, I said, I will not believe that Fury and Joshua are fighting until they are in the ring. Did I not? Yep, you did. <laughs> and everything was locked in. We would be, if the fight was, it was, it was August 7th or the 14th or the 21st. Right. right. We didn't get the fight. <laughs> right. I love it. So, so, so mind you, think about this, right? So two weeks before that, we were saying, man, these guys need to hurry up and make up their mind, get it on. Y'all fighting, y'all not fighting. Y'all done made Deontay Wilder wait a year and a half now. Figure it out. And coming on the show last week, we get the news, oh, it's going to be Fury and Joshua. It's official. So we we both were happy, like, all right, cool. So we got that. Now let's figure out what we're going to do. Wrong. A week later, it's a brand new fight. Yeah. Fury Wilder part three. Is going down. Uh, I'm, I know you're excited for it. I'm excited for it. I'm just happy that they're actually moving forward with some sort of fight at this point within a heavyweight division. Yeah, I'm. I'm very excited for it. Um, so what happened was, and 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 this is actually 
one of the things when I interviewed Deontay um, that we spoke about, um, because this was back when uh, Vladimir Klitschko still had the belt and he was talking about how he didn't want to come see the young bull. He'd rather go the, the other way. So, um, but when you're, when you're the contender, they got to pay you sit aside money to not fight. You know, you'll still, he still had, he'll still get it. He would still gotten his match with Tyson Fury because that's contracted. So they have to have that trilogy. If once, you know, when you uh, lose the belt, there's a, there's a rematch clause usually. Um, but they were going to have to pay him a hefty sit aside fee. And, and uh, Bob Arum didn't want to do that. So, hey, it is what it is. It's under contract. You have to have that, that rematch in there. It's owed to Deontay Wilder. And he's coming for it. He's coming to get it. So, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not mad at him for it. Um, you know, like, it, it is it is what it is. I'm going to really enjoy the fight, though. I think it's going to be a goodie. Um, Joshua, I, I mean, I did want to see that Fury Wilder fight, but he's going to have to – he has his own mandatory that he's going to have to fight. He has to fight Usyk. Um, so he's got a fight that's going to come up. I don't think Usyk is on, on the level – of Wilder or Fury, but we saw uh, Ruiz go in there and, and, and take Joshua down and, 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 and win the belts for a second too. So, you know, who knows? Yeah, I'm just happy that we're, we're moving forward with some sort of fight. Again, we waited a year and a half for the heavyweight division to kind of sort itself out and it still hasn't been sorted out. Um, kudos to Deontay Wilder though, man. Uh, I heard Bob Arum, and, and to a certain extent, Tyson Fury, you know, try to throw a jab at him like, oh, he wants us to pay him 20 million to step aside. Well, yeah, because you made him wait for a year and a half to get his rematch. Yeah. Like, let, let's call a spade a spade. It's not as if this is three months after the fight and you're saying, hey, Deontay, can you wait a little bit so we can knock this one out? You yeah. made the man wait a year and a half to the, par- uh, to the point where an arbitrator had to get involved for you to actually give him the rematch. So what you thought he was going to be happy with a couple million dollars? No. Pay me what pay me what that fight would have generated, which is probably more than 20 million, but yeah. pay me that. And then I'll step to the side and I'll wait. Yeah, but let's, the let's fact that <laughs> right. I mean, and I agree. I, I, don't get me wrong, I wasn't impressed with Deontay Wilder's last performance against Tyson Fury. And I think he's gonna have to improve if he expects to beat him in the Absolutely. third fight. But just from a business standpoint, I had to wait years because Joshua was ducking me. I couldn't even get that fight made. And now you want me to wait on a rematch that we already had a contract for? And then you don't want to pay me what I think I would have generated from the fight? You're yeah. bugging. Bro. That's not, You're no, bugging. Because that's, that's, a, that's a fraction of what he was going to generate from that fight. Right, right. So he, easy. <laughs> that's right. right. <laughs> so exactly. I've already waited a year and a half. You want me to wait longer because y'all were going to fight in August. So now I pretty much was going to have to... I, I wasn't going to fight either one of y'all this year. Let's be clear. Yeah, that's the so y'all fight... Right. If y'all was fighting in August, you wasn't going to turn around and fight me in November or December. So I wasn't going to fight either one of y'all this year. I was going to miss out on that huge bag that I should have got already. And you mad at me? Come on, man. Um, another fight that's been announced. It's also going down in August. Manny Pacquiao against Errol Spence Jr. This, this one is a little surprising because originally we heard Pacquiao Crawford was in the works. Then that got shut down. And then this one came up. It looks like it's official. Both fighters have posted it. Um, promo is going to be rolling out very soon on it. I got a lot of thoughts on this one, Trip, but I want I want to hear yours first on it. First of all, you know, shout out to to Manny Pacquiao, all time great. Um, I don't know if he has enough left to deal with Errol Spence Jr., who I think is the best in that uh, division. But shout out to him for getting back in the ring, though. But I'm just, I, I'm just, I don't think, I just, I just think, I don't think it's going to be close. I think at this point in, in Pacquiao's career, if this we were talking about Pacquiao even five years ago, I might feel like it'd be a little bit more even. But I, I just don't, I just don't see it right now. Maybe you can convince me otherwise, but I don't see it. Trip, this is why we are the dynamic duo because <laughs> you didn't even know. I got stats here for you. I know how much you love the stats. <laughs> but when you said if he would have fought him five years ago, right, you just you threw up the alley-oop and threw your hands up like D-Wade. You didn't even know I was coming from right bang. I was already in motion. Now, Manny Pacquiao's 42 years old, right? 
Manny Pacquiao fought Floyd Mayweather back in 2015. Now, before I give you these stats, I just want to go over some of the things I've been hearing. Because all I keep hearing from people is, wow, Manny Pacquiao's legacy. This is all about legacy. Look at the champion he is. He's taking on challengers that are much younger than him, even at 42 years old. No. Manny Pacquiao is chasing a bag because Manny Pacquiao has had issues with the IRS for about 10 years now. Let's call it what it is. Now, Manny Pacquiao fought Floyd Mayweather back in May of 2015. That was six years ago, right? Since then, I'm going to list off the opponents that Manny Pacquiao has fought. You can stop me when you hear a great fighter on this list, okay? He fought Timothy Bradley for the third time. Now, he had already beat Timothy Bradley in his second fight, and most people feel he, he beat fight. Timothy Bradley in their first fight. Yeah. So in the court of public opinion, you ain't need to fight Timothy Bradley a third time because you already proved us the first two times you could beat him, right? Mm -hmm. That's who he fought. After him, he fought a very young and inexperienced Jesse Vargas. Jesse Vargas had 23 career fights. Jesse Vargas was a good, solid, young fighter, but nowhere near the caliber of somebody who should have been in the ring with Manny Pacquiao, especially when you've only had 23 career fights, yeah. right? Next after Jesse Vargas, you might remember this name, Jeff Horn. He went to Australia <laughs> yeah, to fight I Jeff remember. Horn, who had 17 career fights, right? Yeah. Manny Pacquiao won the, won the fight. We know that, but the scorecards in Australia said differently. He got robbed there, right? After Jeff Horn, he fought a washed up Lucas Matisse. Lucas Matisse was already past his prime four years prior when Danny Garcia put the beats on him on the same Mayweather Pacquiao undercard. <laughs> Right. So Lucas Matisse, Lucas Matisse ain't even fought since he fought for Pacquiao because he was already washed up then. Right. After that, I got another washed up fighter for you, Adrian Broner. So, yeah. So just so we're clear, Adrian Broner is bigger in name than actual stature within yes, the ring. Absolutely. Right. We know that. Adrian Broner's two prior fights to, to fighting Manny Pacquiao. He lost to Mikey Garcia and he had a draw with Jesse Vargas. Adrian Broner had nothing going on when he fought him. And then after that leads us to the you last Manny Pacquiao at that, fight. At that point too. Make sure the check clear. Then after that, Manny Pacquiao fought Keith Thurman. Very good fighter. I give Pacquiao kudos for beating Keith Thurman, who's much younger than him. But we can't ignore the elephant in the room. Keith Thurman, that was his first fight in a year and a half coming off the shoulder surgery. Mm -hmm. Right? So in the last six years, he fought six times. None of those guys, aside from Keith Thurman, were of a level where you would say, man, this is a big challenge for Manny Pacquiao. He's fighting the best of the best in the division. Oh, by the way, four years ago, Crawford was on a hell-bent campaign to call out Manny Pacquiao saying, that's the fight I want. I don't want anybody else. I want Manny Pacquiao. So if you're telling me Manny Pacquiao is fighting for legacy, why didn't he fight Terrence Crawford four years ago? Why was he wasting his time with the likes of Jesse Vargas, Jeff Horn, Lucas Matisse, Adrian Broner? Why was he wasting his time with those guys if it was about legacy? You know what? What they probably meant was this is the legacy fight, but it's going to end his legacy. That's probably what they meant. It must be. <laughs> that it was must be. Going to end that legacy. <laughs> it must be. And one of my least favorite people in all of the sport of boxing is Bob Arum. Yes, we Because know. Bob Arum... Bob Arum, don't you manage Terrence Crawford? Isn't he your fighter? Mm -hmm. Why couldn't he? Why is Terrence Crawford fighting for free on ESPN and not getting major fights against top-notch fighters? But yet, you found a way to get Manny Pacquiao against Errol Spence. You couldn't make a Crawford-Spence fight? That's probably part of the reason. Come on, bro. Our, our good friend Iran had to chase him around his office. But keep that. Come on. Yeah. Nobody. Don't tell nobody. All right? Listen, Manny Pacquiao, I, Manny Pacquiao is an all-time great. There's no debating that. Absolutely. Can't take it away from you. No debating that. Eight division champion has done some of the greatest things the sport has ever seen. All right. <laughs> the only, only fighter during his era that was better than him was Floyd Mayweather. And that's not a knock against Manny Pacquiao. Manny Pacquiao was great during his era. But let's stop the nonsense. This fight has nothing to do with legacy. This is all about a major money grab against a big time young star within the game. Because I just read you the last six fighters that Manny Pacquiao fought. And not one of those guys could headline a pay-per-view. Yeah. Absolutely. He was fighting, he was fighting guys that he knew 
weren't good enough to fight him at that moment. Not to, again, not take anything away from Keith Thurman, but when you ain't fought in a year and a half because of a sh shoulder surgery, Manny Pacquiao probably ain't the best guy to fight right away. Yeah. yeah this but, is all about money, bro. But it's, a, but it's a big payday, so you'll, you know, you'll take it. But yeah, Absolutely. And, and listen, I'm okay with that. If you if you out here check chasing, I'm perfectly okay with that because I want you to get as much money as you possibly can while you can. So I'm okay with that. But let's just call a spade a spade. This ain't no legacy thing because first of all, Pacquiao's legacy been set, and ain't nobody gonna be able to change his legacy. Like you said, a division champion that ain't gonna change. One of the greatest to 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 ever step in the ring. That's not going to change. But that but that that resume uh, 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 post uh, Mayweather. That ain't about that ain't about legacy. It's about check chasing, and let's just call a spade a spade. That's what it is. Absolutely, go get the bag, brother. I ain't mad at you. Go get the bag. But for those of you that are trying to compare this to something, it's not. Yeah. You know, like it, it. Come on, we know, we know what it is. But nonetheless, I will tune in to watch the fight. I'm interested to see. Oh, hell does, yeah. Does, pa does <laughs> Pacquiao have right? Right. Does Pacquiao have just enough magic, maybe, to go up against what some people consider the best fight in the world right now? I think it's gonna be more of a, what happened when the Marquez fight, but that's that's just me. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. Um, and also, we got we got to shout out another guy who did improve his legacy this week. Shout out to Lefty, Phil yes. Mickelson, uh, the oldest to win a major golf tournament, fifty years old. Shout out to him. He's definitely one of the legends, of course. Absolutely. Shout out to him. Congratulations on that. That's, that's a big deal. Shout out to Phil Mickelson. Um, you know, we ain't we ain't really too big too big on big on golf unless it's like the Tiger Woods talk. But we gotta, you know, we gotta pay homage. You know, Phil Phil Mickelson is a legend in his own right. And at 50 years old to to come in and win a major the way he did, you gotta respect, you gotta tip your hat to that man as well. Absolutely. Trip, you wanna shout out the sponsors before we wrap up? I just had the sponsors make it. They've been holding us down. Uh, Petra Home Services, Kmart, uh, my guys over at the Rosado Firm, and of course, Soundview Liquors. Um, make sure you guys are following us on all our social media, facebook.com forward slash Real Fans Real Talk, Twitter, Instagram, at Real Fan Talk. And do not worry if you're not in New York City and you can't watch us on TV Thursdays from 8 to 9 p.m. You can still watch from anywhere in the world at realfansrealtalk.com. And I know y'all already are, and I don't have to say this every week, but just, you know, because we get new fans all the time. So make sure you guys are subscribed to both the Sanchez Show podcast and the Real Fans Real Talk podcast. We are on all major streaming platforms. So whether you listen to Spotify, iHeart, Apple, Google, whatever it is, you can find the Sanchez Show podcast and you can find Real Fans Real Talk podcast. And if you want to if you want to get your growing on, get a little raunchy, get a little adult talk in, you can also subscribe to uh the Shooting the Shit podcast with myself with uh with the, with the, with the legend and our brother Sean Fontaine also on all major streaming platforms. And um, yeah, man, subscribe to that YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash for the fans productions. Yes, sir. And for Trip Young, I am Legend in Two Games. We out of here. Peace. Uh huh. This is real. What's up, guys? I'm Emerald Marie, and be sure to check us out on the web at realfansrealtalk.com.